Main Street by Jacqueline Woodson. Autumn now. The leaves here in New Hampshire are the ones on postcards. Bright red and heartbreaking gold, color so deep and intense it seems it doesn't belong in nature. They sell the postcards at the pharmacy on Main Street, and tourists buy tons of them, scribbling things like, gorgeous here, or right out of our town, and bringing you home some maple syrup, and I can imagine living here one day. Celeste said that's how her mother found Peterborough. She had come up with a busload of people wanting to see the leaves change colors. And she said to herself, maybe one day I'll live here. Celeste said maybe she was so busy looking at the colored leaves, she didn't look around to see that the leaves were the only color in this town. There's a coffee shop on Main, right next to the pharmacy. Even though egg creams weren't always on the menu, the people coming here to look at the leaves kept asking for them. So the owner finally added them, and people coming from the city drink them by the gallon and write their postcards. I haven't learned to like the egg creams, but I sit at the coffee shop some days, drinking Cokes and looking over people's shoulders to watch them write the same things over and over. Sometimes I think I'll see Celeste getting out of a car and running into the drugstore with her mother. But Celeste is gone now. This town is both completely different and absolutely the same without her. Last winter, the snow fell so long and rose so high, my father hired a man from Keene to plow it. When the man arrived, his huge plow moved silently through the mass of snow. The silence surprised me. How could so much power exist inside such quiet? As I watched, pressing my head against the window, I said to my father, I want to move through the world that quietly, that powerfully. Where did you come from? My father said, his eyes at once laughing and worried. I had a mother once, I said into the pain. She used to say things. Don't say that, my father said. You still do. Don't ever say that. But he's wrong. I don't have a mother anymore. It's just my father now, and the leaves, and the snow. In the memory. There are things you're not allowed to say. When I was very young, it was the curses I'd heard my mother use, the words erupting from her mouth, but disconnected, too ugly to belong to someone as beautiful as my mother. One morning, I stood in front of the mirror saying the words over and over. My father found me this way. Neither of us knew that exactly eight days from that moment, my mother would move on to the next place. We thought the doctors were wrong. We prayed, please, doctors, in the name of our Holy Father, be wrong. What are you saying? My father said when he heard me. Don't ever say those words, ever. But Mama says them. She's in pain, my father said. Those words should only be said by people in pain. I wanted to tell him I was in pain. I wanted to show him where it hurt, point to my head, my heart, my belly, say, here, Daddy, and here, and here but I didn't. I was eight years old. He would say I was too young to know real pain. After all, he said, you've never even skinned a knee, treetop. Then rub my head and smile that halfway real, halfway crying smile. That winter, I hurt every place my mother hurt. As I pressed wet cloths to her sweating forehead, as I let her hold my hand to wait out the pain, as I read to her from gossip magazines and gently brushed her thinning hair, each twist of pain moving through her moving through her moved through me i wanted to tell my father this that once i had lived inside my mother a part of her i wanted to say how could i not know her pain what kind of a name is treetop anyway celeste asked the first time she heard my father call me this we were 9 years old and celeste was my new best friend she had moved to new hampshire from new york city she was tall and brown and beautiful. Her mother had modeled for magazines. The first time I asked him where babies came from, he said treetops. Celeste squinted and pulled her lips to the side. I had practiced doing this in the mirror, but it never looked all the amazing things hers looked. You know that's not true, right? Yeah, of course, but the name stuck. <laughs> My dad would never say that, Celeste told me. He'd say, look it up, but he'd never call me look it up just saying. We laughed. From the moment we became friends, it seemed we spent so much of our time laughing. She told me her father spent his days figuring out what to do with other people's money. He likes counting it, she said, and recounting and recounting. He's tall like me, she said. She said her parents were taking a break from each other. 
After all, 11 years is a long time to be together, don't you think? I shrugged. When my mother died, she and my father had been together 20 years. They had been middle school sweethearts. My father said he couldn't imagine living without her. I didn't tell Celeste this. I didn't say. The people who don't want breaks sometimes get them, but maybe she saw something in the way I stared at the ground. We were at the park, which was empty and cold. We were dragging our feet below our swings, moving slowly back and forth. You miss her, huh? I nodded. I miss my dad, Celeste said, and I miss New York. I know me some missing. I looked up. She was smiling. Then we were laughing again. That quickly, we were looking at each other and laughing so hard we had to bend over, nearly falling out of our swings. I had never known anyone brown, and Celeste had never lived in a place where brown people didn't. It's negro list, she said, smiling. It's a negro-free zone. I thought we didn't say that word anymore. Celeste looked at me. You can't, but I can. It's in the language rule book, I swear. You're lying, right? There's not really a language rule book. Nope, not lying. There are all kinds of rule books. The New Hampshire rule book says that only one family that's not white can live here at a time. When I move away, another family will come. I swear it's in the rule book. Celeste looked at me a moment, then smiled. I swear, but you're not going to move away. I wasn't smiling. Not tomorrow. This was the year my other friends disappeared. One by one, they wanted to know why, when we had all been friends since forever, I needed this new friend now. The one black person my mother knew stole stuff, Casey said. They love rap music, Lizbeth said. Does she teach you dances? Celeste plays the piano, I said quietly. She's been playing since she was small. Beethoven. She can play Beethoven. The others and I were still friends there. Then, our dolls between our laps, their blonde hair getting wrapped into braids and curls and cut and dyed. I sat in their pink bedrooms, the rooms I'd sat in for as long as I could sit alone and listened without knowing what to say back. It hurts here and here, I was thinking, and I don't know why it hurts, but it does. Aren't you scared? They asked. She might take things from you. She might have a gun or a knife. Her feet are big. Her hair is strange. There was one at our school once, you remember? She was adopted or something. That's all I remember. My mom said I shouldn't eat with a new one. You shouldn't either. Celeste arrived long after the doctors told my mother there was nothing they could do, and at night my father sat behind the bathroom door, gulping back sobs. She arrived long after we buried my mother. My father and me at the graveside, our gloved hands locked together. Lizbeth and Casey beside, behind me, standing between their own parents, safe from cancer and dead parents and holes opened in the ground. Celeste arrived in the late winter and smiled at me. Your mom would be mad if she knew, Lizbeth and Casey said. Celeste pulled me through town, making me name the trees we passed. White birch, barberry, sugar maple, sugar maple, catalpa. How do you know that? She asked again and again. How do you know? Black walnut, beech, oak, pine, I said, because I loved the feeling of her hand in mine, loved the surprising softness. I didn't tell her I had never touched a black person before and how surprised I was the first time I touched her hair. But the second time I reached for it, Celeste's hand shot up, caught mine just inches from her head. Stop, she said once when I was reaching for her head. I am not a dog to be petted. The following autumn, we buried Celeste's pet, Celeste's pet rabbit Joe in her backyard, sprinkling crushed leaves over his tiny grave. We had been friends for close to a year and somewhere in that time had grown to the same height, wore our jeans rolled at the ankle and tied our shirts in matching knots at our waists. Celeste wore her hair out, an amazing black halo floating over her head. I had learned to keep my hands out of it, but at school she was constantly slapping the other kids' hands away. Some mornings, when she thought no one was looking, I saw her face dip into a sadness I had only seen on my father. Those days, I wanted to grab her hand and hold on tight. But we were 11. What did we know about anything? Spring came again. I like your treetop, Celeste said to me one morning, but I don't like it here. 
but you love the leaves and the egg creams. My mom said we'd give it a year. It's been more than a year, Celeste said. She wouldn't look at me. And then finally she did. New York is only four and a half hours away. I know. But we both knew the distance between New Hampshire and New York was forever away, a whole lifetime. Celeste laced her fingers inside of mine. The way our fingers go, she said, brown, white, brown, white. It's like the same God or Mother Nature or universe that decided to make the leaves here all crazy colored said this. She held up our hands. This is right, too. Some afternoons, Lizbeth and Casey meet me at the pharmacy on Main Street, and the three of us sit at the window where we can watch people moving through town. Before she moved back, Celeste and I made a promise that we'd meet in New York City and celebrate our 18th birthdays together. In a week, I'll be 12. It'll be here before you know it, Celeste said. Why are you squinting? Lizbeth asked me. You act like you're not even here. And she's right. I am already leaving. I'm halfway gone.